Spring River in the lowlands, the Delta area, uh, which is where a tremendous amount of ground fighting took place. This is the base I was at. You can see that. There's a B-52 taking off. Uh, B-52s were also at the base. I have another picture, which is probably uh, an illegal picture. I'll show it to you anyway. It's probably declassified by now. I won't get in trouble. Uh, B-52 shared the base that we were at, uh, and uh, they were flying bombing missions over North Vietnam from December. Uh, this, this was an operation called Linebacker 2. It was supposed to be the effort by the Air Force to put an end to the war, to continue to make them to negotiate and put an end to the war. It was a very high intensity and intensive uh, bombing campaign nightly uh, over, uh, over North Vietnam. And that's what the people in the B-52s from this space were, were talking about, or were, were involved in. I was talking with Mr. Ford earlier this week when we were discussing this program, uh, and I one of the pilots on one of the B-52s was a close friend with my co-pilot, who was one of the men in one of the pictures you just saw. Uh, and they had gone to pilot school together, and they were pretty close, and we had eaten dinner with this man and another member of his crew uh, one evening. The next night they were shot down. Uh, they were captured, they weren't killed, they were captured uh, and put it, held as prisoners for the remainder of the war, which just turned out to be about two months. Uh, but it's kind of, uh, you know, I, we, we realized that, that we weren't in a tremendous amount of danger. Uh, we get credit for flying, I get credit for flying 33 combat missions, uh, but actually participating in combat operations, I, I find that kind of a stretch, even though we were flying combat missions in a combat zone with combat airplanes and taking part in that uh, we realized that the danger level on our part was not much more than it would be stateside. Of course, when you're involved in any military operation or any kind of flying, there's always some danger and some risk involved. Uh, but when we see that the people that we're having dinner with, the people we're socializing with, are getting shot down, in some cases are being killed, uh, it kind of brings it home to you a little bit. Four, please. Team four. Hey, this is, uh, you can actually see in the, the center of this picture is the base I was at. We were actually coming in, approaching for a landing. We were right on the water. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see there were buildings off to the left a little bit in the runway. You can't see it really clearly because it was a little bit hazy that day. Uh, but the runway is out in the center area, uh, heading from lower left to upper right part of the picture. Okay, more F4s. Uh, this is the, actually an you know, approach to landing from the other direction. You can see the runway in the foreground. Clouds. It was always cloudy. Always cloudy here. I don't know what that is. A uh, trailer we lived at, uh, we had our crew lived in that trailer. Under the trailer was a uh, nice family of, of, of very dangerous looking snakes lived under our trailer. <laughs> Uh, and uh, actually we were pretty lucky to be in the trailers. Uh, it took us probably a month or five weeks to be moved into a trailer from a barracks area. Uh, once we got a trailer, it was just my crew that was in the trailer. In fact, just the officers. The, uh, the boom operator was an enlisted man and he was still in the enlisted, the enlisted quarters. Yes? Were you in just one half of them? The pilot, who was the commanding officer, had the, the far end. Uh, and the co-pilot and I shared bunks. You can see the two, uh, the two windows up and down there. Uh, the lower bunk was mine, the upper bunk was his, and that's where the, that's where the bunks were. And it was nothing in the trailer except the bunks, and you know, there were no such things as microwaves or anything back then, so we, you know, there was a bathroom at, uh, uh, in the bunks, and that was pretty much it. A table to write, to write letters or postcards at, and that was fine. We didn't spend much time in there, that was, that's where you slept. Uh, the point details there are all B-52s. Uh, this is a KC-135 landing. We were waiting to take off uh, in line following this guy landing. The operations were 24 hours. It was constant takeoffs and landings, uh, and we would probably fly four or five days a week. 33, 33 combat missions. We were there for uh, under 90 days, but the war ended halfway through. So I was actually, uh, I told Mr. Ford this last week also, I was actually, I'll leave this picture up while I tell this story, I was actually flying airborne over the Gulf of Tonkin right at the DMZ on the last night of the war. They had already made the arrangements. The fighting will stop, the shooting will stop. It's like uh, the end of the armistice at the end of World War I, 11 o'clock in the morning, 11 of November 1918. Well, this was the same thing. They picked a date and a time, 
and the fighting will stop then. I think it was like 6 a.m. Uh, Vietnamese local time on, uh, I don't even remember the date, did June, January 28th? I, I think that's what the date was. 73. Uh, it might have been a little bit later, but somewhere right in there in, in 1972. And then some of the heaviest fighting um, of that period of time occurred the night before. Because everyone wanted, because they knew when the fighting stopped, whatever land or territory you had control of, you would keep control of. And so there was a lot of heavy fighting that night before so that people could keep control of the territory that they had when the shooting stopped. Uh, and, and that night we were flying, it was probably 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, refueling F-4s. Of course, this is a daylight picture. Uh, and we had two F-4s that we had just given gas to, and they were called, called on to make a strike, and they, they went down and they, they did their business. We were waiting for them to come back up. And uh, after about 20 minutes, uh, the pilot of one of the F-4s said, uh, We'll only have uh, there'll be one receiver returning. So the the other one we didn't ask because you don't ask, uh, but the other one was obviously uh, was shot down. It, it really excuse me I don't use this word often. It really sucks to be shot down in the last night of the war. <laughs> okay, uh, this is another F4. So it looks like both bombs and fuel tanks. Same one. This is an F-105 Wild Weasel. Uh, the, the job of this airplane was to attack enemy radar sites. They would home in on the radar radar, radar beacons. Uh, this is a two-seater. That's why I know it's a Wild Weasel. It had both a pilot and a, an electronics weapon system operator uh, who would, would home in on that enemy radar site uh, and destroy the anti-aircraft. They still do the same thing. As soon as they turn it on, you can get a, a lock on your position, and you can, your weapons can then lock on to the radar site. Uh, they do the same, the same thing in Iraq in both Iraq and both for this one. This is another F-105, this is a one. Uh, this is an F-105 receiving fuel. A very, very large airplane. This is an, uh, oh. an A-7. Yes? How does that work? How does what work? Uh, you're doing, uh, you actually make contact. The, the way that it works is that it, it's the responsibility of the receiver pilot. Uh, and you can see that he is looking up. Well, it's kind of hard to see because he has his visor down. Yes. But he is looking up uh, at the, the bottom of our airplane. There are actually a system of lights and color codes on the bottom of our airplane that should be positioned in a certain place in his view uh, to be in the right position. Uh, the job of the tanker is simply to, to fly level and straight uh, until the receiver comes up underneath uh, and makes, and, and make, if he puts himself in the right position, then the boom operator, uh, using the wings on the, on the end of the boom there, you can see the two things sticking up in a V. Uh, he can, those are called uh, rudivators, and he can fly the boom using those to control it, uh, and then when he gets in the right position, he extends the nozzle to, to make contact, and then it actually clamps on. Okay, it doesn't clamp on uh, forever. I mean, it, it's a certain, it's like a torque. If a certain amount of pressure or, or force is exerted on it, it'll break, up, it'll break off. And it won't break off, it'll separate. It'll come loose. And then they just fly back there. You can move around a little bit under there. There's, there's a lot of play in the, in the boom and up and down. Okay? And the gap, the fuel simply goes through the boom uh, into his tanks. And we can, we can give away all the, and the, the way the tankers were designed, they can give away every bit of gas that we have. And in certain war situations, in the Cold War, in the nuclear war, uh, there were certain times when we were, would be required to do that. But not in this. Okay, and you can see another, a lot of rivers, I, I'm not sure what river that was, it was not the Mekong Me Me River. And you can see again the, the bombs, uh, the smart bombs on the, on the, again, the 1971 version of smart bombs on the wings, plus the extra blue wings. He's going away, and he's going away, and he's going away. <laughs> Two of them, and I think we'll stop there. Okay, I'll uh, I'll let leave this on to Google Probox, and I'll open up for questions. You have questions? Take advantage of the man, please. Michael, first question. Then would you get the lights, too, please? Four, was that a Phantom? Yes, F-4 Phantom. Uh, the F-4 Phantom was an a, a airplane that could basically do it all. It was designed to do it all. Uh, and like any airplane that does it all, it doesn't do anything really, really well. 
it was a good solid airplane, but it was designed for both use off carriers for the Navy uh, and for the Air Force. Uh, it was it was a, a very good, adequate, well, more than adequate, uh, tough airplane that was the mainstay in the Vietnam. Yeah. Yes. Did you consider it a, an irrational decision when Nixon ordered linebacker? Uh, at that particular time, probably not. I think it was something that at, at that time was necessary to make make a point and, and stop the U.S. involvement. They were looking for a way out of that war since Nixon was elected. He got elected on the premise that he was going to end the war. Uh, and he hadn't done it. In fact, it had gotten worse. Is it true that he didn't want to lose the war? Uh, well, losing and winning is, is a matter of uh, for historians to decide, I think. Uh, I don't think there's a, a man who was there who says we lost the war. I, I, just, I just don't think that. I don't feel that, that we were on the losing side. I think politically uh, there were some bad decisions made. Militarily, I don't think we were prepared to fight that kind of a war. Uh, whenever you get into a war where you have a lot of draftees and a lot of discontent at home, which of course, this is the only war we've had that to that extent, except maybe the Civil War. Uh, it, it's always tough for the soldiers, very, very tough for the soldiers. Did you uh, willingly One second, enlist? Please. Group six. Uh, willingly is, is, yes, I enlisted. That was I drafted. Uh, it, this was the situation in 1969. Uh, I was in college. I was a college senior. Uh, I was trained as a teacher, actually an elementary teacher. Uh, and like everyone else, I was uh, in my college graduating class. Uh, I was looking for a job. That's what you do when you're a senior in college, you look for a job. Uh, there's also uh, a draft, and they had a draft lottery. Uh, the draft lottery was by the job. Uh, the question they asked me was, what is your draft number? And I had to tell them. And the second question they asked me, are you healthy? And I had to tell them that as far as I knew I was. And they said, thank you very much. We'll have to hire someone else. So at that point, it was either be drafted or uh, do something, have some control over my future. And that was to uh, go, into, go to the Air Force recruiter and see what I could do as a college graduate. I qualified for officer's training school. After officer's training school, they were only looking for pilots and navigators at that time. They had enough of the logistics officers and enough security officers. They had enough of those. Uh, and uh, because of eyesight, I didn't wear glasses then, but because of eyesight, uh, I didn't qualify for pilot training, but I did for navigator training. So that's so I decided to go that way. Uh, at that point, not really intending to make a career. Uh, however, I ended up staying at 14 years old. What, do you, what are the standards for eyesight? Uh, I'm not sure what they are now. They also have height requirements and, and this kind of thing. Some people were just too tall. Uh, and some people were too short because you can't sit in the seat or you can't bend over and uh, sit up with a canopy and close the door. Oh, yeah. uh, my particular problem was a peripheral vision problem. Right now, I don't know if I can make it because of my vocals, but <laughs> that's an age problem. So, any other questions? Uh, yes? How much gas could your uh, tanker hold? Uh, we did it in pounds. Uh, it was about six, uh, about six pounds a gallon, and we would take off. The highest we could take off was about 180,000 pounds, which would be around 30,000 gallons. Okay. Uh, when we took off at, at, at heavy weight, which we did not often, uh, not often, especially there because the temperature has a lot to do with the humidity, has a lot to do with it. Uh, we would uh, two thirds of the gross weight of the airplane would be fuel. We would usually give them up to seven, please. Eight to ten, eight to ten thousand pounds. I can't remember exactly, but eight to ten thousand pounds. And we, if we were down to six thousand pounds in our tanks, we were at pretty good fuel. Six thousand pounds is not much. If they had six thousand pounds, they were fine. We had we had situations like that uh, not involved. Actually, we were on a, a mission where we were escorting. Uh, a lot of F-4s that were returning, they were bring, just bringing the airplanes back. They had a lot of airplanes that were, were over there. And this was probably in 1973 or 4, after it had down. Uh, and we were escorting planes over there. We had one pilot who I happened to have gone to obviously training school uh, who made a mistake and he started to abort and made return and then he fixed his problem and returned to the flight which was with, which is an absolute no-no because we didn't have enough gas flow. So everyone in that in that entire flight of probably six tankers and maybe 30 or 40 fighters was jeopardized by that seemingly innocuous mistake 
uh, okay, I'm fixing it, I'm going to rejoin my group. And then we can have the guests. And we got to really manipulate who's going to, and when we landed, uh, what we like to say is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, well, you have this picture that shows us standing in front of the airplane. And the, the crew entry hatch is open here, and there's, you can't see it, but there's a ladder hanging down there. And usually if the airplane was heavy, that first step would be a very short step to get on that ladder. When we got off the airplane that day, the first step was a very long step because the airplane wasn't very heavy on the wheels and so on. So and you knew you knew when you took a long step that you were pretty low on gas. And it was flying over water, almost all the way to Guam and back, landing in Hawaii, which you know didn't give you a lot of leeway. Yeah. Was there a specific procedure for one, like if you made contact with an enemy aircraft while you were handling? Yeah. Yeah, to, to, get, to get the heck out of there. No, there really wasn't, and, and we didn't really have that fear. I don't think any of us really felt that that was really an option, because we're refueling fighters. They're not going to, and they didn't have enough aircraft or enough range, because they didn't have refuel, refueling, uh, to really get to us. The only time we really felt that we had to be on the lookout and, and really cautious was when we were up in that area around the Gulf of Tonkin or DMZ. Uh, it was one very, very, very dark night that we flew up in northern Laos, which wasn't far from China. And we were, you know, very, pretty, pretty careful in, in on, the, on the ball when we were up there. But there's always, we're always in radar contact, and there's always someone telling us. We didn't have any way of knowing. But my radar was a ground mapping radar, and that was the operator of that. But it was not an airplane, airplane radar, and I, so I couldn't tell if anyone was coming. Now you said when those two airplanes didn't come back that one time, mm -hmm. one of them didn't come back, yeah. you said you can't talk about that? No, no, he, they wouldn't, we wouldn't ask, hey, where's your buddy? That was just was not, not a cool thing to do. So we just, he said, uh, 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 I, I'm not sure the exact words, some of the effect of uh, uh, only, a, we're only a single receiver. Receiver is the difference between receiver and gas. We knew that when they went down, there were two. But when he came back, the pilot of the plane returning said, uh, we'll be a single receiver return. And you just don't ask. You just, they ride it. The one track gas. Now we have to assume, yeah, I'm not sure, but we have to assume that he, he may have gone home. Maybe he didn't, maybe he had some battle damage and flew on home, but I would imagine if he was going to do that, he would have come back to the gas first. Yeah. Yes? Did you want to be a sort of study teacher in the uh, I actually had, had trained and went to college uh, to be an elementary school teacher. And as, as I said, uh, my my job, I had a job offer. I think I had a couple of mm -hmm. very, very nice job offers. Uh, in southern Massachusetts, where I would probably be today ready to retire rather than having Eight. several years to go. Yes, you said you spent 14 years in service? 14 years in the How many of this was in? He's moving around. Uh, well, I went in uh, right after college, graduated from college in 70, uh, was uh, in officer training by December. I got married in, in July of 70, went to officer training in uh, December of 70, went to navigator training in March of 71, uh, and started my first assignment in March of 70. March of 72. It was 72, and I said it was 71, it was actually 72 and 73 that, that was uh, uh, and, and went to Thailand in December 72. And so I now got out of the military in 85. So most of it was after. When I was there, I was a, I believe, a first lieutenant. When I, when I left, I was a lieutenant. Did you station out of base when you were? Uh, when I was in Thailand, I was, it was called a TDY, or temporary duty. Uh, my actual base assignment was Loring Air Force Base in Northern Maine. Uh, at I've also been stationed. That was my first permanent assignment. I've also been stationed for four years at Major Air Force Base in Sacramento, California, uh, as a navigator instructor in the navigator training school. So I taught. Basically, I taught Who's in the here? navigator training school for four years, both classroom instruction. Because before I try to move uh, it, and, and, like, and then uh, okay, the game was done. I was at Griffiths from '79 to '85. In the meantime, I was also uh, spent some time in Turkey. I spent some time in Spain. Spent some time in England. Uh, <coughs> spent some time in Guam, Hawaii. Yes. Um, what were you doing here? I don't know. Uh, longevity. <laughs> what to do? As I said, when you know me as a mild-mannered, and, and I think that was uh, the, the main thing. Uh, yes. When when we graduated from navigator school, what do you have? Ten minutes. When we navigated, uh, when we, nav when we graduated from navigator school, uh, your assignment was based on your class rank. 
but I think there were 60 or 70 of us who graduated out of probably 90 or so school. that started. Um, and, and what would oh. happen was a, what they would call a block of assignments would come down to each graduating class based on the, on the needs of the Air Force. We need uh, you can do 25 people to sit in the backseat of those F-4s. Well, there's a war on That's a combat job. Do you want to do that? Well, I kind of wanted to because you know, I'm a guy and, uh, and, and a little macho, and that's what we do. But at the same time, I was newly married, had a, a, a very young daughter, uh, and it, it seems that maybe that I didn't really want to do that. Did I want to do that for myself? Uh, w would it be exciting? Sure. Sure, that's exciting. That's, that's the stuff. I mean, you, you're, if you're, when you're a flyer, okay. you want to fly fast and you want to fly low and uh, you want to do all kinds of crazy things with the airplane. And uh, if there's a war on, you, you tend to want to be a part of it rather than have it skip you over. But on the other hand, you have family considerations. And if you're given the option, uh, you know, something that flies high and out of the out of harm's way and uh, uh, it's still flying, and it's still a camaraderie, and it's still a military the unit, and it's still, you know, that seemed like a yeah. better option. Besides that, it was mostly over in stateside, over in the United States, knowing that, of course, this, this, this type of assignment was most probable once or twice. I only went once because of war. Did that answer your question? Next team, please. Nine? Yeah. Nine? Yes. Are you constantly? You just kind of go like that. Constantly? No, it was, uh, it's like anything else. You know, one of the things that they, they told us in, in, in flying training, and they talk about that, that flying is uh, hours and hours of boredom uh, uh, spiced up by moments of sheer terror. Okay, and it was a lot of, a lot of hours and hours of boredom. We, we flew around in circles. We didn't go anywhere. When we were when we refueling, we would fly around and fly around and fly around, and then sometimes we get a receiver. Sometimes we fly around for six, seven hours, and then they say, oh, nobody comes and go home. So no, sometimes we're just flying around. They, they, they call it boring holes in the sky. We bored a lot of holes in the sky. Yes? Uh, the NAV bomb competition, uh, 1980. I was the, uh, the tanker navigator from Griffiths uh, who won the local competition and then represented Griffiths uh, in the NAV bombing, and actually we weren't bombing, we were just navigating. So I, I represented Griffiths as, a, as the navigator in there in the competition, sack white competition. We came out somewhere in the middle. That's what this other picture is. This picture of the crew thing here, that's the, the crew from that particular. That was my crew at the time. We were the lead crew, the lead tanker crew at the Griffiths. And this was taken as part of that. Anything else? Uh, yes. Did you come to Rome because of Griffiths? Yes, I was assigned here in 1979. And, uh, <coughs> Anthony, any questions? No. No questions? Yes. How about some of the people that you met? Um, what impressions on you? Uh, one of the things with uh, most military people and, and virtually everybody that I met was nobody, as far as the war goes, uh, nobody really wanted to, yeah, you're gung-ho and it's the thing to do because you're a military person and there's a war on it, it's your job. Uh, but no one really wanted to be over there, away from their families, uh, participating in a, in a war. Especially a war that may have been not really popular at home. Uh, a lot of bases had demonstrations. But the people did it, uh, and they did it willingly. Uh, some of them did it with a little bit of bravado, some of them did it with a little bit of sadness, some of them did it with a little bit of uh, just simply acceptance, uh, but they all did it, and it's and and they did it without a lot of accolades and a lot of uh, things in the press. Uh, we, the returning heroes from Iraq, or the returning heroes from the uh, Desert Storm, or whatever. We didn't get any of that. We did it because it was our job to do it, and, and that's the kind of people uh, that I met. Uh, willing to do their job, willing to take a risk, even though most of you lined up were taking a tremendous risk. Uh, willing to leave their families uh, uh, to do the job that I mean, that was required. Yes. Did you feel the war was justified? At the time, probably. Uh, looking back on it, I, I just see a lot of uh, political mistakes that were made, uh, a lot of misleading 
uh, not that the government still deceives the public, uh, but uh, misleading of the public, misleading of one government agency by another government agency. We're looking at the things that happened in Iraq with uh, the night, uh, was it the uh, Nigerian, uh, uh, uranium, and all of these things here. Uh, that were going on with uh, Saddam Hussein. Yeah, the government was misleading. Uh, some of the things that happened uh, in 1963, in 1964, in 1965 uh, that were reported as justification didn't happen, or it didn't happen the way they were reported. They were designed to convince Congress and to convince the American public that this was a justified thing to do. Uh, looking back on it, 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 the war probably was not justified, at least not to the extent that we get into it. And we, I think naively got sucked into it. Uh, Regrettably, for the 59,000 uh, Americans who didn't come back. Yeah. Um, among the soldiers, uh, was there criticism of Johnson and Wilson? Among soldiers, sure. And not among us that much. You uh, know, we're the elite officer corps uh, flying up above all the fray, but, uh, but among the, the soldiers on the ground, you'll, you'll probably get to talk to some of them, and you'll probably understand that there was a lot, a lot of criticism because they weren't the ones getting shot at. Uh, the other question, go ahead. What's the visor on your helmet? Uh, the visor is two visors. Uh, and this is, you know, I, I never really used the visor, but it's designed on. primarily for uh, protection. And this is actually a, a, a sun visor. The other one is clear. So there's a double visor. Which is, I haven't touched this thing in 20 years. <laughs> It's a double visor, uh, basically for protection, uh, bird strikes, or if you happen to bail out. The only time I would, ha I would have, as in my position, sitting sideways uh, and kind of a, sitting at an office with a nice instrument panel in front of me, uh, the only time I would have this down would be in a bailout situation. Uh, and the KC-135 bailout was uh, through that, that same door that's open on the bottom of the, uh, the, the, the picture of the crew here. The same door that's here. We would pull a handle down, which shoves a bar into that door, into the front of that door, which puts the, the door into the slipstream, which rips it off. Okay. So which means you now have a hole in the bottom of the airplane. We hang by the bar and let go. Go down the chute and now into the thing. Nobody ever did that. Eleven. No one ever did that, and and. Uh, no one really knew what would happen if we would just bounce on the bottom of the airplane a couple of times. So we were all probably happy we wouldn't do that. But the only time I would use these visors is for that. And that would simply to keep the, the, the 400 mile an hour wind off my, off my head. How old is the like, training mission and stuff? I mean, I'm sure there's some kind of basic training support you got over there. How well did those help you? Training, focus the, the, Coping was a flying, flying, we didn't even think about flying, we just, you up there doing your job. Uh, coping with the age somewhere away from home, uh, with a lot of uh, free time in your hands, with nothing to do, that's, that's tough. That's tough. And, and when you look at the, the soldiers that are in Iraq now and that kind of stuff, uh, I know I know how they feel, somewhat. Because I've been there a couple of times, not there, but uh, several times, off for three or four months at a time, away from family away from the things you know, away from what you're comfortable with. So it's certainly uncomfortable. And it, you, it's hard to get trained for that. We as Americans, we live a pretty soft life. And uh, take us out of that, it's pretty soft life. And even the military, it's, it's hard to, to prepare yourself for that. Were you or are you still very close with your family? No, we were, yeah. We were close. We didn't go out and party a lot. Our families still saw each other. It was always a close bond with, with any crew that you were on. Our crews changed reasonably. Uh, often, uh, but Christmas cards, that kind of stuff. You, your family probably gets Christmas cards from college, but you know that kind of stuff. Well, you know, radio, radio silence, pretty much. Even though we're talking to each other, we can talk on it on intercom. Uh, we didn't have a lot to say. We didn't really have a lot to say. Um, yeah. Uh, were you involved in any post-Vietnam military assessments? Just the, uh, as far as the war goes, yeah. uh, just that we turned we, when we were out in Hawaii for several weeks, escorting, bringing fighters back, because there were a whole bunch of airplanes that were over there that they were sending, they were bringing pilots over to fly them back. That's cool. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Do we get a camera? Put our what? Do we get a camera?
yeah, that's a that's a part of my life that uh, that I, I it changed me a lot. It made me a, a better person, a stronger person. Uh, I used to be shy. We have a little less than a minute, but I would really like to a double thank you to our guests. <laughs> For a few days, or would that help? It's with me, as long as it doesn't warm yes. up. Yes. <laughs> and, though my wife wouldn't mind yeah. it, one of you as a team are going to get the paperwork, and then we won't have to rush with the 45 minute limit. We can take our time. Thank you. Uh.